All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode six of SFF Addicts for our panel on climate change and climate fiction. And I'm very, very pleased today to be joined by four guests uh, from all over the world and from different backgrounds. So we get good perspectives on climate change. First up, we have Sam J. Miller. He's the Nebula Shirley Jackson and John W. Campbell Memorial Award winning author of Blackfish City, The Art of Starving, and The Blade Between. His short fiction has been featured in Clark's World, Asimov's, Lightspeed, and numerous best, uh, year's best story collections. He's also the last in a long line of butchers, something very fitting for this panel on climate change. Thanks for being here, Sam. Thanks for having me. All right. And next up is Claire North, the pen name of Catherine Webb. She's the World Fantasy and John W. Campbell Memorial Award winning author of The First 15 Lives of Harry August, 84K, The Pursuit of William Abbey, and more. Her latest novel, Notes from the Burning Age, was released earlier this year. She also writes under the name Kate Griffin and could very likely change her name again during the course of this podcast. Welcome to the panel, Claire. Thanks for having me. Hello. Hello. Also joining us is Matt Kressel. He's the Nebula Fan- World Fantasy and UG Award nominated author of King of Shards, book one in the World Mender trilogy, the Newman, the Newmanverse fictional world, and more. His many short stories have been published in Tor.com, io9, Lightspeed, Clark's World, Interzone, and other magazines and anthologies. He's also the host of the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series in New York, and his latest story, Now We Paint Worlds, was released through Tor.com last July. Happy to have you here, Matt. Good to be here. All right. And finally, we have Premi Mohammed. She's an Indo-Caribbean scientist and speculative fiction author, best known for her novels, Beneath the Rising, a finalist for the Crawford, Aurora, British Fantasy, and Locus Awards, and A Broken Darkness as well as the novellas These Lifeless Lifeless Things and What We Can Offer You Tonight and The Annual Migration of Clouds. Her next novel, The Void Ascendant, is the final book in the Beneath the Rising trilogy and is due out in March 2022. Welcome, Primi. Glad you could join us. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Well, starting off, um, we're just going to go through everybody. Uh, You can tell us a bit about yourself. And for my part, I want to know how you first got introduced to the climate the climate change concept and, and how did it affect you? So let's start with Claire. Oh, blimey. Um, okay. Um, Put you hi, on the spot. I'm Claire North. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm Claire North. If you haven't guessed already, I am British and in the UK right now. Um, we were taught a bit about climate change at school, but I was of that generation where you're like, it's fine. You know, the West has won, as the historians would put it. Everything is going to be fluffy and great and stable. And then I graduated into the financial crisis. You know, Trump happened, Brexit happened, and with that, my generation of frankly comfortable, not to think about it too much, women of middle class comfort in the UK had to start turning around and going, hold on a second, is this broken? Um, and the second you start asking that, you realize that yes, it is. Um, so I went on, I think, a very similar journey to most people of my generation of realizing that the promise we had been made by the dawn of the 21st century was not going to be kept by the middle of it. Um, and I am now an activist for the Green Party in the UK. Um, I accidentally stand for council occasionally and spend a lot of time writing copy about local environmental issues. Fantastic. And what about you, Matt? Um, I think I first became aware of climate issues and climate change in, in college. I, I took a course um, it was ostensibly a philosophy course, but it was basically environmental fiction. And so, you know, we went through like the so-called canon, like Rachel Carson and, and, um, and like, you know, Thoreau and then Aldo Leopold and and others. And um, it was, it was really eye-opening for me. And, and um, I, I, I guess that class made me realize that I had always been an environmentalist, but never like consciously thought about it. Like, my father was um, always a, a big gardener and, you know, from a very young age, I had my hands in the earth and like the smell of earth like today brings me back to like when I was four planting strawberries with him. Um, so it was like at that point, um, I started really becoming aware of like global warming. Um, and I remember uh, trying to raise awareness uh, with friends and family and others about this issue. Um, I actually started the global warming news group, if you remember those from back in the day, Usenet. Um, and I just remember like talking to my family and being like, uh, you know, this is a really serious issue. We have to be concerned about this. You know, um, driving an SUV is basically the equivalent of leaving your refrigerator door open for an entire year. Just driving an SUV for like 
a week or something. And people, you know, my family's like, yeah, oh, no, totally. We totally agree with you. And then they'd go out and buy an SUV, right? So um, it was uh, it was really kind of an uphill battle and, and, um, and disheartening that way. And then just another angle at it, um, I was also like a, you know, as I think we all are huge science fiction fans and really just loving the film uh, Blade Runner. Um, and then what I began to notice um, when I started my career in writing and, and afterward is like how that kind of dystopian vision of the future has become a default vision of the future. It's like if you just Google sci-fi art, you know, 95% of what shows up is dystopian art and not, not a different view of the future. And especially in the last few years in my work, I've been con consciously trying to work against that vision of the future because I think we need alternate visions of the future to to look forward to. Yeah, I mean, that for me growing up was like the the future. I mean, like acid rain and neon is kind of like the encapsulation of that. And I love Blade Runner as well. Um, but I'll let uh, Premia and Sam go first, and then I'll give you guys a little background on my my history with climate change. So Premi, what about you? Oh, yeah. Um, I guess I'm very much of that generation that uh, started off not worrying about climate change because what we were worried about was, uh, for some reason, being bombed by the Russians. Um, why they would choose to bomb us in the Canadian prairies, I, I never actually got an answer to that, but they, they were definitely going to do it. And then later, uh, we kind of saw the, the Montreal Protocol work out for um, CFCs, and we were like, well, you know, that was easy, and now the ozone hole is closing back up, so we'll probably just do that for everything, right? 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 Yeah, no, it didn't happen. Um, and also, I think very much being raised with the idea that uh, alternate energy sources like uh, solar and wind and nuclear were going to solve this looming problem that we had been taught about in school. And uh, to watch that not happening at all is a little disheartening. And I don't know how they could have uh, tried to prepare us for it when we were kids, but in my own family, I see part of that problem, um, which is that my parents are immigrants. They came from, uh, I guess, what we used to call a third world country, and I would probably say underdeveloped, although they did recently discover oil. Good for them, whatever. Um, my dad grew up literally eating out of the dump to survive. And so here in, in Canada, if you tell him something like, you know, maybe we should be flying less, maybe we should try to cut down our consumption, they look at me like I've grown a second head. Like, how, how dare you suggest that we not consume to the full extent of our abilities uh, because the rest of the world was doing that while we were starving in South America? Uh, and I think that's part of the, uh, the people problem, the psychology problem behind why changing consumption habits is a battleship that's very hard to turn. And if we're talking about literature, one of the first cl climate, climate-ish, climate-y books I remember reading was, uh, I read J.G. Ballard's The Drowned World in high school. And first of all, I, I probably needed to be on like a ton of drugs to really <laughs> uh, pick up what he was putting down. <laughs> But I think it also may have inoculated me with the idea that this was inevitable, that this, more than Blade Runner, was our future. In Blade Runner, you notice there's still um, a civilization. <laughs> there's still people with uh, jobs, and uh, there's some sort of working police force, and there's bars and noodle stands and all that kind of thing. And by the time you get to the drowned world, it's like, no, it's just people who are as high as balls and a drowned world. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a lot of points that we're going to be discussing throughout. Um, and it's good that you, that you have that personal connection. So I think this will be a lot of fuel to add to the, to the fire of this discussion, to put it lightly. Uh, but first, we'll get into Sam, if you can give us a little uh, introduction to how you first came across climate change and how, how it affected you. I mean, full disclosure, I was an angry punk rock teenage communist um, from the time that uh, Walmart came to my hometown and put my dad's butcher shop out of business. Um, and so 
I was like, you know, I was going to punk shows. I was reading the zines. I was like, I had the AK Press uh, catalog, which was like this amazing compendium of like cool books that you'd never buy, but you read the little description and you're like, oh, I just got educated on this subject. So I was aware of climate change as like a real problem that was definitely going to screw us all up. And I've been a vegetarian since I was 18. So at, from like an animal rights perspective, I've always been sort of conscious of, um, you know, the extinction of species and the sort of like consequences of human action. But I always, um, I, I've also, I was, I spent 15 years as a community organizer in New York City. I've been an activist on a lot of issues. And so I always have this sort of like mentality where like, you know, that's the environmentalists work. Like there's people working on that. I was working on housing and homelessness and police reform. And I was like, you know, this is the thing that is real. Um, this is the, the work that I'm doing. I, I had a job with a homeless led organization um, that was fighting for um, housing and policing justice. Um, and it wasn't until 2012 when Hurricane Sandy hit New York um, and not only like screwed up our transit infrastructure and um, messed up, flooded our subway tunnels to an extent that we've only in the last year um, finished repairing um, just in time for another hurricane to mess everything up. Uh, uh, also, like displaced a ton of people, like a lot of the homeless folks I was working with um, had been displaced from like the Rockaways by Hurricane Sandy. And so this idea that like, you know, I, I understood inter intersectionality as a sort of concept, but the idea that like, no, climate change is not only like not separate from like racism and the history of like housing in America, um, but it is like, you know, directly, it is directly intertwined. And the idea that like, in that climate justice is the province of people who care about that, who are probably mostly better off and, and, and removed from some of the exigencies of, of daily life um, uh, is, is wrong. And that actually like the folks who are, you know, um, on the front lines, the, the, the low income sort of traditionally marginalized communities need to be the ones leading that fight. Um, and, and they are intertwined and they need to, they need to be solved together. So um, that was sort of like my, oh, like, oh, not, like, always acknowledging that it's there and knowing that it's a reality and that we're probably super screwed, but like, not only like, oh, it's everybody's problem and we need to fight to change it, but like the stories we tell matter and that changing that narrative of like environmental action is the province of rich, privileged people who don't have any other problems um, is like, you know, um, not untrue in many ways, but also like can be changed and needs to be sort of reframed so that it's understood as like, not separate from all these other things. And that's the sort of exciting thing for me about science fiction um, is like throwing it all together of like how the housing crisis and histories of colonialism and racism and gender oppression um, are, are impacted by and intertwined with uh, climate catastrophe. I mean, that's very, that's very poignant and perfect for, for everything that we're going to be discussing because you hit the nail on the head, the interconnectedness of it all. Um, this is something that I, I grew up with. I mean, like Matt, my dad had a bit of a green thumb. He was the kind of guy that his car always smelled like, uh, like old beer cans because he would always stop on the side of the road and pick up all the beer cans and stuff like that. So I remember just going with him all the time to recycling plants and stuff like that. And having this very clear perception of, um, what it means to sort of like do your small part. Not necessarily that, um, you know, I come from a privileged family. I grew up in Canada and, you know, my parents were, were pretty well off. Um, but my dad still found that sense of groundedness in order to do his part, regardless of, of how it presented itself. And I always really respected that. And then as I lived the rest of my life, you know, I lived in Germany and saw how people do it there. Um, and now I live in Ecuador, which, you know, like Premi said, you know, it's an underdeveloped country, uh, third world, however you want to call it. But here I get slapped in the face a lot with um, situations and um, imagery of how the sort of like perception and communication changes based on where you grow up. So here there's some really, really beautiful rivers that were once beautiful. My brother-in-law has a teacher or had a teacher in high school that showed him and uh, his class a picture of 
this river um, back in the 60s where she was uh, skinny dipping with some friends. You know, the photo was taken before they did skinny dipping, but she's an honest teacher. So she told them. (laughs) And that river now is polluted with the runoff from a beer factory, unfortunately. So you walk down the paths and, and go near that river and it smells like old hops. And it's really like, disgusting kind of nausea inducing and other rivers where you see you know there's like a cascade of trash just flowing down the side of it because people just feel that it's easier to discard their waste in a way that's immediate and just toss it over the edge and never have to see it again so it's kind of um stark in the confrontation that i that i see you know having lived in the first world and now living in in an undeveloped, undeveloping nation, I would say Ecuador is, but, um, we'll get into this later in terms of, of sort of like what the, the responsibility is between developed nations and developing and undeveloped nations. Um, but first I want to get into how, um, Sam, you kind of, you got into this a little bit, so we'll start with you, how your perceptions of climate change developed to the point where you felt that fiction was a good avenue of expressing it i mean i'll just be honest and say that like i had been doing community organizing for a really long time and uh it's a very difficult work and i was super burned out is not the right word but like i had lost a certain like spark of um belief and hope that like change was possible and that we could like do things within the existing framework um And so like after spending a really long time fighting for bills around like landlords ability to keep property empty while people are homeless um, and like finally winning, getting legislation passed that was supposed to be amazing and that nothing happened with. Um, So in a lot of ways, it was just sort of like um, I realized that like the stories people have in their heads are a real obstacle to transformation or at least they are the potential for change. you know, like you, we, we saw this in like 2019, I feel that like the, po- the parameters of the possible shifted and that suddenly climate change, which had been sort of like, you know, scoffed at and laughed at by a lot of folks, um, sort of took center stage and, and became a sort of dominant realization in a lot of ways, in a lot of, um, in, in many ways, in part uh, because of the activism of young people. Um, so feeling like, oh, well, if, you know, as the conversation shifts, then new things become possible and things that were impossible through rigorous organizing and activism for years might become possible if people think differently. So thinking of, um, you know, storytelling as a, as an important, um, vehicle for that, which has always been my thing. I'm, I'm always, I've always been sort of like a storyteller with an ax or several to grind of like, let me tell queer stories. Let me tell like the weird, the weird, messed up, twisted, ravaged heart um, stories. Um, so I think that storytelling as activism is like fundamental to what storytelling is. Um, and so climate change just ended up sort of occupying part of, of, of how, I, how I do that. Mm-hmm. And what about you, Claire? Um, so I came from a privileged background in terms of place of birth, in terms of family, in terms of all of that jazz. And as the years have rolled by, the suspicion has increasingly dawned on me that if you have privilege, you need to damn well take responsibility and use it. And in a way, I think it's actually kind of connects to a certain extent to a conversation we're probably going to have about climate justice and the fact that for 150 years, the in italics developed world has happily burnt coal while exploiting, let's face it, the rest of the world brutally for its own aims. is now like, ah, oh, but everyone else should change. I think that the first step to making any difference to the world at all ever is to face some responsibility and step up and try and take ownership for your actions rather than do what our illustrious governments mostly do in certainly in the UK and I think in America and large parts of the world just go oh well we need someone else to show leadership first like the definition of leadership is you show some leadership um so I've always felt quite strongly that privilege brings with it a degree of responsibility um But specifically as well for me, in terms of storytelling as well, I think that therefore there is a responsibility that comes with storytelling. And the danger is not to be didactic with it. And I think, you know, Sam, I 
Electric City is not didactic in any way. You tell these brilliant and amazing stories, and I haven't read some of your other stuff, but like the story is what communicates. Facts and figures and stats turn off the mind, but by telling an emotional story that connects to readers, we can actually begin a conversation in a different way. And that's why it's so important to do that and take responsibility for storytelling as fun and joyful and emotional, but also responsibility for the fact that we are telling stories in the context of a wider world. Um, and for me, I think that's something I can do with what little power I have. Um, and I have a friend who works for the um, WWF, not the wrestling one, who was complaining about exactly the thing we were saying earlier about the Blade Runner thing. All visions of the future are let's eat dog meat out of tin cans while covered in ashes. But actually, hope is more powerful than cynicism. Hope is how you change something. If you look at our current climate leaders, what they inspire is hope, not fear. And there is, I think, a really important role that culture has to play in that. If culture can move, society does follow. Historically, society will follow along with the shift in culture. And I think it's in a kind of slightly grim way. It is an honour to be part of that. Um, we do live in interesting times, that old climate, uh, that old Chinese curse. But if we can make something good of the interesting times we live in, if we can look back and say, well, I turned up, you know, I was there, I joined the march and I tried to tell the story. I think there is, there is a degree of honour in that. And I would like to feel even slightly honoured in my work, perhaps, hopefully, maybe. No, I think everyone here can, can say that they are stepping up and doing their part. And um, Matthew, what's your perspective? Um, I, I think I, I came to, to writing climate fiction mostly from a place of anxiety. So, I, you know, I, I, I think a lot of my fiction comes from just me uh, kind of externalizing and, and codifying the fears that I have that are subconscious and work my way through them. So a lot of times, like, I, I have this intense ball of emotion that I'm, I, I need to express in one in one way or another and it comes out through my fiction so a lot of my later fiction has been climate related um you know specific specifically because i feel like um as claire and and, and sam said like you know there's not really a lot of action on, on these fronts and so i it, it was like well, what does a world look like where where no one's doing anything? You know, there was that that famous uh, David Simon photo of the, of the people playing golf while the there's fires burning in the background. You know, and it's just like doo -doo -doo, and it's kind of like where we are as the world right now. Um, so that's like one part of it was just me just kind of trying to um, work through my anxieties and and kind of find how I feel about these things. And the other one I think is just, is a more conscious approach in that I feel as if, um, you know, dystopia or post-apocalypse as a cautionary tale doesn't really work. I mean, if, if it did work, you know, like I, I almost feel as if some of these post-apocalyptic works are like instruction manuals rather than cautionary tales. And, you know, we, we have so much of this stuff and some of it's really good and really compelling and, and has really strong characters who, who, who work through adversity. And that, to me, is very, very inspiring. But at the same time, I also wanted to see works of fiction that show how we can navigate through this difficult time into a brighter future. So, like, I'm really excited about stuff that i'm seeing happening right now in like the solar punk movement and the cli-fi the climate fiction movement and quote unquote hope punk you know i know there was some discussion about is hope punk even a thing but that's another story but i guess what i'm saying is like there's a conscious effort to kind of write against that, you know, dark fiction Blade Runner trope to actually write a future and that is positive and optimistic, but that doesn't mean that it, it's a, a story without conflict, a story without tension or, st you know, um, because I, I, you know, I've said this before, utopia is not a noun, it's a verb. It's something that you have to work towards. It's something that you have to attack in every way possible. And sometimes, you know, both in fiction and in reality, 
you know, the system is set up in such a way, these systemic injustices that it's, it's like, it's, it's nearly impossible to work within the system to, to create change. So I, I think I'm excited about the, you know, the quote unquote punk movements to, to make change outside of the system. And, and I see fiction, solar punk fiction as being part of that. Yeah, I agree. And we will get into more optimistic representations of it. I just always find it funny that punk is the is the denomination that's always added to the end of it. Sam, you're probably a big fan of that. Punk everything. But it's like hope punk, you know? I'm just putting in my head this image of a of like a really energetic punk kid who's like, I'm super fucking happy and excited and optimistic right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So I just love the terminology of it. Um, and Premi, what about you? What's your perspective on on sort of how you shifted your views of climate change and what you want to say into the realm of fiction? Yeah, I don't know. I've been thinking about it while uh, the other three have been talking and just kind of being like, oh, yeah, I did that. I didn't do that. I did that. I didn't do that. Um, which has been really interesting. I think you can see in various parts of my fiction almost maybe kind of the the journey that I took as I got older I guess because I've been working in the environmental field for about 20 years uh doing research doing environmental consulting uh I used to work for uh one of the biggest oil companies in the world um I I also used to work I spent about 6 years at a at a metal refinery um, now I work for a uh, government. I'm a government scientist and uh, I'm in the environmental field. I work for Alberta Environment and Parks. And the whole time I've been watching my fiction kind of go like, bleh, bleh, in terms of what it thinks is going to happen in the future. And um, yeah, it's, I've got a couple of things where, you know, so Beneath the Rising and, and the sequel involve the, like they, they kick off with the development of a clean energy reactor that solves the world's climate problem um, in a hand wavy way that seems like magic. Uh, in my story, um, Some Solace for Thy Woes, it's quite far in the future and two of the characters have a little chat about, yeah, how we have uh, clean energy now. And also we've started um, a, a circular or an iterative economy. We're not extracting resources anymore. We're just using what's already there. So. Um, the world got better, the world healed. And when I look at my most recent book, which is The Annual Migration of Clouds, which just came out on Tuesday, uh, we didn't, thank you, we didn't solve climate change. Every climate disaster that was predicted happened. And this is some time after that, and all we're doing is rebuilding. And I think that sort of recapitulates my own thinking, which was, when I was younger, when I was just coming out of school, um, the thought was, we're going to do something. We can do something. The solutions are there. And that means that we are going to do something. And now that I've been in government for about seven years, my thinking is, no, nope, nothing, literally nothing actually is going to be done in my lifetime, probably not in anyone's lifetimes to even put the brakes on the causes and effects of climate change. So maybe I'll write something where we just rebuild um, and try not to make it look like freaking threads or something, because thank you, threads, that's been traumatizing me for years. But <laughs> yeah, I hate to say it, but it's it, for me, it's kind of been a journey from optimism to, uh, well, maybe there will still be people. After I mean, all this, do you, do you, from your, from your experience, you know, you live in Alberta, you've worked for the government, you've worked for an oil company. Um, and for anyone who's not really aware, Alberta is kind of like the Texas of Canada. Um, you know, I'm sure you've been to, or know a lot about the tar sands in Northern Alberta. Yeah. Um, that's part of my portfolio. Yeah. So what, in terms of both pessimistic and optimistic ways, how has your actual personal experience or work experience come into play in the the, the world building or the characters? Um, sort of building on what you what you said before, but we'll just dig into it a little bit more. 
Yeah, I I try not to put anything into my books that will actually get me sued. Um, I don't know if that's working, <laughs> but w when you're a public servant, I think that's always a fear. But uh, in in clouds, they do mention you know the tar sands and whatnot, and the the impression that's given is well, technological civilization is kind of collapsed, so it's tools down for everybody. But I don't know that people are aware exactly of the issues with the with the with the tar sands, which is not just that they are giant emitters. Um, that they that they put out so much CO2 that they require so much CO2 for their operations that it actually makes a blip on Canada's overall contributions, but also that those tailings ponds are, as far as we can tell, permanent. They're never going to um, settle out on their own without intervention, and because the intervention to bring them back to a livable standard, um, or even some kind of bearing weight, like such that a bird could land on them and not sink instantly. That's possible. The technology is there. Um, but because it's expensive, the oil companies uh, have said, no, we don't want to do it. And our government thus far for the last 60 years or so has said, OK, we're not going to make you then. I don't picture that changing um, no matter what government is in power. And I think that's more the issue that I have for the world as a whole, which everybody has figured out. I feel like long before I did, which is that governments are essentially run by corporations. Corporations are going to try to run as efficiently as they can. And a world without any resiliency, without any backups, without any redundancy is full of single failure points. And climate change is the result of that single failure point of trying to run as lean to the bone as possible and not make any changes to allow for externalities like environmental protection. Mm -hmm. Um, Sam, just, just what you just said, I'm writing down think single of... failure point. Sorry. What was the question? <laughs> Put that in my next book. Um, that made me immediately think of, of Blackfish City because it's sort of, um, it's sort of like a backup plan for humanity after these single failure points of humanity just manifest in so many devastating ways, you know? Um, and the actual city itself that sits in the middle of the sea, you know, from your experience and, and how you view climate change, how did you approach that as, as a setting? Um, I think that I, I, I struggle with dystopia and utopia and I feel like, um, you know, life is both, right? That like for many people in the world right now, life is utopian and safe and beautiful and full of wonder and magic and, and everything's great. Um, and a block away, there's people who, for whom life is dystopia, right? And working with homeless folks, um, you know, really seeing up close that there's people for whom like life is worse than the zombie apocalypse movies, right? That like they're sleep deprived because the cops kick them awake every 90 minutes to tell them to move along. And they're subject to having all their belongings taken and some random strangers might kill them um as happens often um to homeless folks who are sleeping in public so um you know i think that i've always wanted to capture in my fiction that like life is both that that that's that's how life works right is that at no point in human history has it not been the case that some people have been living super well and some people have been living horrible lives and and it's hard for me to imagine a point in the future where that's not true um so so i i, I want to be like hopeful and excited and imagine solutions to problems um, and, and be real about the ways in which those solutions will probably create new problems. Um, for me, the, the, you know, people say utopia is boring. Um, but I always, I always say that like, you know, human nature is what it is. And I, you know, there's like a Marxist argument that like, no, human nature has been conditioned by capitalism. And so what we think of as human nature is actually like the nature of colonialism and post-colonialism and oppression and exploitation and extraction. Um, and I, you know, I kind of buy that, but I also kind of think that like, we're going to be, we're going to struggle with addiction, no matter what we're going to struggle with, um, dep with clinical depression and also, and mental illness and many other problems, no matter what. So even as I'm imagining, um, solutions to our problems, um, I think that that still creates plenty of room for good stories, um, stories that are compelling and, and, and that 
impact people and, and that engage people and that are populated by people who feel real and human and alive, um, even if they're not, you know, homo sapiens, um, even if they're animals or, or um, uh, artificial intelligences um, or whatever. Um, so that was my approach with Blackfish City. And, I, and that's my approach with, with, with what I'm working on now is like, yes, I want to believe that like, you know, like Primi said, like having, having been in the work for a long time, I am deeply cynical about whether or not transformative change is going to come to many of these fundamental things. But like, you know, crazy shit we didn't anticipate happens all the time. And so, and, and, and so it's very, it's possible for me to believe and tell stories where like, oh, and then we discovered this technology that's like, you use this like genetically modified fungus and it's essentially the same as plastic and, and it biodegrades. And so suddenly we don't use plastics anymore, right? Like I, I'm skeptical of the sort of like, quote, techno bro solutionism of Silicon Valley, where like, we're going to solve all our problems with new tech. Um, but I do want to think of like, I'm, we're science fiction, right? We are, we are supposed to think of weird, crazy shit that um, will make people go, huh. Yeah. And speaking of crazy shit, Matt, your, uh, your world mentor series is a lot more uh, fantastical, um, sort of a bit more outside the realm of, of near future. And I was curious from your perspective, um, how does using sort of like a more fantastical allegory of climate change, um, how does this help you tackle and discuss uh, climate change as an issue? Yeah. Okay. So, so like, you know, King of Shards was uh, written a long time ago. And, and I, you know, I, I think with, with that, um, I was more focusing on uh, this idea that, you know, actually it's similar to along the lines of what Sam was saying is that like some people are living in, you know, a relative utopia while others are in a dystopia. And, you know, in, in that world, it's like, um, Earth is a is a relative utopia compared to these hell worlds, these hell shards that demons live on. But you know the reason why they're so angry and pissed at humanity is because you know we have it pretty good, and they they live in in hell literally. Uh, so yeah, that that's what I was going for there. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say those were climate fiction uh, story or a climate fiction story, like if. If you want like a specific example of something that I wrote um, about climate fiction, I would I would definitely say um, the Marsh of Camarina, uh, which is basically a story where this this young woman graduates from college uh, with a degree in computer science, and it just so happens that AI is really really good at programming at this point, so she can't find a job, and so she's offered a uh, a chance to go live in this experimental community in Canada. They'll give her a UBI and they're basically like anarcho-socialists and, and farmers. And so she has to reorient her life um, uh, around this. Like she had this whole vision of herself and had to completely shift it into this, into this other reality. And I think that with that story specifically, I was trying to explore, um, you know, climate change may change all of our trajectories. Like we all have this vision of what we're going to be doing in 10, 15, 20 years, and that may not happen. So what do we do then? And so that, that's really what I was going for that one. And then uh, the other short story I have is called Your Future is Pending. So this takes place in a um, unnamed future city where climate change, like it's pretty much dangerous to go outside after like 11 a.m. because it's too hot. So everyone just spends their time inside and um gets it's like a, a future social media where people are like immersed in like virtual reality to the point that like if you're wealthy you actually can pay for a robot to take care of your body while you're immersed in virtual reality so the protagonist of this story is someone who takes care of the robots who takes care of the people and um but the real core uh premise of the story is about how our lives are, are kind of on autopilot controlled by algorithms. Like, so we, we go on social media, pretty much everything you see is based on an algorithm. It's opaque to you. You don't get to choose. Like I have my friends list. Let's say you are all on my friends list. I think, I think you are. 
but I'm not guaranteed to see your post. Like Twitter or Facebook or whatever chooses how that's based on some opaque algorithm. When I say opaque, I mean something that they decide and, and they might not even be deciding. It might be some weird, you know, um, algorithm in the, in the bowels of some, you know, uh, you know, cloud computer somewhere that's, that's determining this based, you know, on proper user, you know, to maximize user engagement. So, you know, I think we've all had that experience where, you know, you call up someone on the phone and say there's a problem with your credit card or, or you need some kind of service and you call up and you're on hold and you finally get somebody and you're like, yeah, you know, I am having problem X. And then the person on the other line goes, well, my computer says Y, you know, and you're like, okay, but like that it's clearly like a real problem. And so basically what's happening is we're deferring our power to algorithms and it's to bring it back is what I'm seeing with climate change is this kind of, we're all on autopilot. We're all just doing what we're always doing. We're not really thinking about the future. We're not thinking beyond tomorrow. We're not, we're barely thinking a year ahead, if that, you know? So like all these algorithms and, and things are just like running our lives. Everything's on autopilot and who's in control, who's steering the ship. And that to me is a terrible anxiety. I see that not just in climate change, but in like, you know, I work in IT, I see it in computer security, I see it in, in other avenues. And it's like, it terrifies me. So I, I think like, that's, that was one thing. I mean, I have other, other stories that are more optimistic. Like one that's currently out on submission is, um, is basically uh, where it becomes illegal to drill for oil so that there's still a need for plastics. So recycling becomes much bigger than it is now, because I think we all know, right, that we only about, what is it, 15% of the stuff that we put in our recycling bin is actually recycled. Like 85% of it goes into a dump. Um, one day that garbage dump may actually be valuable because we can't make plastic out of oil anymore. So we might actually be making, be recycling the plastic in those dumps that nobody wants. It's buried underground. So it was just this idea that like the future may be very different from what we envision now because of, because of climate change, because of all these issues. Yeah. And actually that, that notion of, um, recycling and plastic, Claire, um, I know in notes from the burning age, there's a lot of, since it is in farther in the future, there is a lot of different perception of like the resources that came before the things that existed and are sort of being, um, repurposed or sort of, uh, tweaked in order to fit the current narrative in that book. Um, so how does, how does, uh, how does that, as well as your perspective on climate change, fit into into the works that you write and notes from the burning age in particular? Um, you can totally cut this, but I might just be a terrible author and slightly skew and not talk about my own book for a second because so many interesting things have come up and I'm aware that it's not necessarily a hugely long podcast. Deep breath in case you want to cut that. <laughs> hey, sorry, just to like. There's so many things that have just been said by everyone. I just want to ask questions of other people just for a second, if that's okay. And then I'll totally pitch yep. my own book. But like, <laughs> all of us have talked about writing from a place of anxiety. And if we've learned anything in the last two years of COVID and plague, as well as climate change, it's that being creative while anxious is unbelievably hard. Like, it's much easier to create when not like stressed out of your mind. Um, and so in many ways, what I think is interesting about everything we're doing as writers and everything that the kind of sci-fi movement is doing, if you can call it a movement, is trying to channel anxiety into something good. And that seems to be a phenomenally different, difficult creative task. And it's not necessarily the same as even finding optimism. There seems to be, in literature particularly, literature loves a hero story, essentially. And with climate change, one of the problems we have is there are not many heroes. There's Greta Thunberg, there's David Attenborough. David Attenborough will be dead soon, though it breaks my heart to say it because he's 5,000 years old and Greta Thunberg is still a teenager and we can't put it on her. And literature loves a hero and we love a hero who solves it. So 
from my point of view as a writer, there's this massively difficult creative problem of how do you tell stories about climate change while writing from a place of anxiety, while not playing down the truth of it, because the truth is important, but while also creating something optimistic, but also while acknowledging that stories love a hero. And climate change stories do not necessarily have one hero, they have a movement, and that creates a massive, massive challenge from a writing point of view. And I just kind of wondered, because I feel like everyone has touched on something like this, how everyone in this podcast deals with approaching anxiety and realism as you write, and how you've actually stayed sane doing that. Because the only way I stay sane is by writing. If I write stories that I feel are empowering to humans, then I can feel slightly heroic a little bit in my own way and feel like I'm doing my part, even though I know I'm just one of millions and millions and millions of people trying to create this narrative. Um, but I, the, the, the complexity and the challenge of being creative and being honest with that and hopefully inspiring people with that instead of just scaring people seems like a monumental task for literature as a whole to solve. Who wants to jump in there? This question. I can, I can, <laughs> Get, I can go for it, Sam. I can try. Um, <laughs> I, you know, someone someone once said that the spoiler alert to all my stuff is collective action is the superpower. Um, and so often, while I acknowledge and agree that like conventional narratives love heroes and telling the story of the person who makes the difference is is how we are accustomed to seeing that. But often, what I'm trying to do is show that collectives have power, that communities have power, and that where there's space for heroism is often in that ability to bring people together. And so um, telling stories that are like converging, like many people coming together to form a community and take action or, or people whose, whose strength lies not in lone, brave acts of sacrifice um, um, or, or unrelatable <laughs> heroism. Say, say goodbye to rugged individualism. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can be rugged all you want, but you're part of a community, whether you like it or not. And you, you are shaped by your, your people, your history, the nation, the world, karma, whatever. So, um, that's my sort of like, um, antidote to that or my ability that my sort of attempt to take that tendency and turn that into something that will leave people feeling that they have the power to make change, but also that like, like we are like few of us will be faced in our lifetimes with the moment that characters are really presented with all the time of like, will you make the right decision to like shut down the evil computer that's going to destroy the world? Or will you expose the injustice that you've uncovered? Right. That doesn't, that doesn't really happen. Right. But what, what does happen every day is like, will you choose to, to do something to make a difference, even if it's small, even if it's inconvenient. And so that's, that's how I want to sort of take that, that, that sort of, at least Western, uh, I don't want to say universal, but that, that, that very common approach to storytelling that we're familiar with of like, you know, the, hero, the, rugged, the rugged hero solving all the problems and saying like, no, it's about community. It's about people coming together. That's how change happens in real life. That's how things have, may, have changed, right? People talk about technology solving problems, but in the absence of like a justice movement, um, technology will only reinforce existing divisions and problems. And positivity plays a huge part in all of this, you know, connectivity and positivity, bringing people together to work towards some kind of solution, you know, and Matt, you, you recently wrote a blog post on hope punk, um, sort of just as, as like a, as a title, but also, uh, briefly talking about the, the movement itself, um, from your perspective, what, what role do more optimistic or positive, um, genres have in the future of climate change yeah i mean i i, I this is a good um question because i it actually uh also segues with what clara asked um so you know i i think that i would never put the responsibility of like solving climate change on literature i i mean that's just like a huge responsibility but i think that in art in general what we can do is provide um, inspiration and, and alternate narratives that provide people a sense that a different future is possible. So, you know, it's like that Bradbury story, uh, All Summers in a Day, right? Where it's, it's like raining every single day. And then that one day of sunshine, it's like, oh my God, I didn't know this was possible. Um, I, I think that a lot of our visions of the future 
are dark and bleak. And if we provide an alternative vision of the future, even if it's just something small, it doesn't have to be like, you know, the hero's journey that solves the problem for the whole globe, but just something small, um, enough to, to inspire someone to say, oh yeah, that's possible. There, this, is, this, is what, um, this is what we could do and we're not doing. Um, I, I, I think that's incredibly important. Um, you know, whether or not hope punk as a, as a genre description is accurate or, or is a good term. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I often find that, um, you know, when you're talking about genre distinctions, it's splitting hairs. And, and honestly, I, I don't have that much interest in calling something this or that. I mean, I leave that up to like, you know, historians and librarians. Um, you know, I, 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 but I, I do think that finding there's always a story, right? There's always a story, you know, and finding that story that gives people that little bit of ray of sunshine, right? That maybe something better is possible. I think that is a, a beautiful thing that that art can do. Yeah, I agree, and I'm also I, I'm curious. I'll, I'll put this out to everybody. Um, where you feel, um, well, speaking of genre classifications and all that crap, uh, where something like young adult fiction might fit into this in terms of, um, sort of bridging a gap between our generation and the generation that's coming after us and how these stories that are more geared towards, uh, teenagers and young adults might be um sort of like the motivators or the the spark that ignites their their passion in these things if anyone wants to jump in on that well all i will say is this and because i'll let others speak at this but uh i i feel like when you're a young reader you're a lot less critical of 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 stuff and a lot less judgmental so i think that it's it's a way to kind of uh, reach people before we get before they get cynical and and get you know just you know you know now if you had something that was like you know look the future is beautiful and you know we're we we're stopped using oil and everything's um solar power and and you know um it's post scarcity no one's going hungry and no one's homeless and someone's like oh this what is this saccharine junk you know and people s cynical and won't read it but like a young reader might be like oh wow this is really cool what you know and then when they they get into their 20s or maybe they go into college and they decide what to major in they're going to be like oh no i this is i want to i want that future that i read about right because like you know I, I grew up watching like Star Trek Next Generation. You know, I want I want my post scarcity future. I want like a future where I can like everyone. You're hungry. You go to your your uh, your uh, replicator and you print out. You know, you, you you replicate your dinner and you get everyone's clothed and and things like that. So if we can inspire kids that way before we they grow up into cynical adults, you know, I think that's that's good. Yeah. Anyone else? No. Well. Well. Uh um, I just think we should maybe take the moment to shout out Spring Awakening, um, just in terms of the power of literature to start a movement. Spring Awakening, for all it may be a massively flawed book of its time, literally kicked fired an environmentalist movement that has changed the world. So literature does not have to solve climate change. It just cannot solve climate change. But I think we should shout out the forebearers who went before, who turned around decades and decades ago and did genuinely kickstart a change in conversation. Culture does have this power if we are respectful and honourable of it and do it right and tell good stories. And uh, like, and actually, Spring Awakening is also in many ways a testament to the power of adults to change as well. Because even though, yes, technically speaking, you start paying council tax and immediately your heart fails from your body, um, what adults then do is they have children. And actually, there is a new hope that comes with there is a generation that comes after. And if you look at the history of corporate America, if you look at the history of capitalism, if you look at the history of most fossil fuel extraction, the common denominator is I want the next generation to be richer than my own. And it's the old modalist of thinking. It's the old ways of thinking. No one started digging up oil with a cry of, I don't care if I poison the planet because I'll be rich today. Well, some people did. Let's be fair. 
Some people did. But the vast majority of corporate structures full of people going, oh, I mean it the best for my kids. And to stand up and to say, let's do what's right for climate change. If that immediately damages my kids' well-being because I'll lose my job or you know, I'll lose security upon which I depend, that is a hard thing to ask. So yes, I agree that adults can be cynical, but movements have been changed by books and adults fundamentally 90% of the time, 99% of the time, mean the best, even if they then screw that up monumentally badly systemically, which we do because we're idiots. Just a bunch of Bless idiots, ourselves. cynical adults. Oh, yes. And actually, this, um, this transitions nicely. I want to sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, get into what are some of the, the biggest challenges that we, that we face going ahead, at least from your particular perspective. I know this is a very grand question, um, but what are some ways that you personally feel we could uh, tackle that particular issue? Uh, we'll start with Primi. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I had a physical reaction when you said, what are the biggest challenges? Um, <laughs> these are the challenges that I'm doing 40 to 70 hours a week uh, in my day job. Um, part of it is, I think, as we've been discussing the, the narrativity of it um, and the way we all kind of agree, humans respond to facts and figures, but what we respond to best and most easily is a story that has a beginning, middle, and an end, and has heroes and villains, there's something in us that says, oh, okay, that just slotted right into a spot in my brain, and it fits there. Um, so what we've got here is a villain that's climate change, and we think, oh, change doesn't sound so bad, life is change. And we've got something called global warming, and we think, well, it's nice to be warm, isn't it? And you, you just can't impress upon people psychologically how dangerous and bad this is. And we need a, a term that fits into a story that says, no, the villain is that we are loading the atmosphere with humongous amounts of energy that it can't get rid of, and that global systems, that global biogeochemical systems and ecosystems and air currents and ocean currents are going to shut down and affect everybody, and they're going to start affecting the people who have done the least to contribute it the most. But it's not going to spare anyone. And Governments are not communicating that. Um, scientists are not communicating that. And in terms of a hero, and I'm thinking again of Claire's question of how do we write through this anxiety um, without that clear sort of chosen one narrative? And the answer, I guess, with what Sam said is, yeah, it's, it's everybody. It has to be collective. But I keep thinking, and again, this is coming from the point of view of a public servant in, in environmental science is the, the, the premise of any kind of large movement or any kind of revolution is kind of like, ah, let's go over the top, guys. Let's go over the barrier. They can't kill all of us. Uh, whereas corporations are like, yes, we can. We don't care if we do kill all of you. There's lots of you. Climate change also doesn't care either. So I... I'm coming at this from a very, very cynical point of view, which is that, um, you know, we're, we're not even like ping pong balls being thrown against the battleship that is the current system of, uh, you know, climate disaster. We're, we're not even air molecules because wind can move a ship. We're like muons. We're going straight through it. Um, the ship isn't turning. So the only place that I'm finding any source of... Uh, hope or optimism is that humanity is good at adaptation. That everything that we foresee coming is going to come, and we're just going to have to hit and roll. Um, I don't know if you guys have read that deep adaptation paper uh, that came out a few years ago. I really recommend it. And of course, now I can't remember the author. But um, it's fascinating, a little depressing. Uh, it lays out the science really crisply and clearly, but basically the gist of it is... Um, we can't, in, in our lifetimes, we can't probably escape these disasters, but what we can do is adapt. And so what we should be doing is deciding now the best ways that we're going to adapt rather than having us try to scramble to do it desperately later. So for me, that's, that's where my stories, I guess, are going, is that we're going to take the hit, but we're going to hit and roll. Yeah, and on the topic of adaptation, I think that, um, Sam, I'm going to toss this to you. Um, since a lot of your work focuses on communities and cities and and 
that is a part of the world. All these different conglomerations of people that will have to adapt in very complicated ways. Um, so I'm curious what your take is on what the challenges are that face uh, cities in the future um, and how communities might be able to come together in that setting in order to survive, adapt, affect some sort of meaningful change? I mean, I think that um, for me, part of that is about re like reconfiguring like when we say how will a city respond right we are imagining a city to be a homogeneous thing right like um with a government and with people who are aligned and and in many ways obviously the people who live in the city are aligned um but also like you know what like so i've been writing um uh what, what i'm writing now takes place in a partially flooded manhattan um, and so like, there's lots of people who have a lot of money and a lot of property who would be devastated by Manhattan, um, being flooded and all of their assets being suddenly rendered, um, worthless. But there's lots of people now who have nothing who, for whom like suddenly all these office towers being abandoned would be great because right now suddenly housing is not a problem. Right. So, um, part of it is like Primi said, it's about adaptation and it's about re like understanding that like things are in flux, obviously. Um, you know, we know that that in many ways, climate change disaster is going to disproportionately impact the people who had the least to do with causing it. Um, but also, um, like I want, I'm trying to imagine stories where this can be a trigger for societal transformation, and where like you know, great change uh, or or moments of catastrophe can create the potential for great change. And and usually, honestly, that change is terrible. I remember after 9/11, there was a lot of talk about like, oh, the old paradigm. Um, of geopolitical status quo isn't working and, and this proves it. And instead, we obviously saw this huge, horrific militarism and, and racism and xenophobia and, 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 and global surge in anti-Islam uh, sentiment. So most catastrophes get seized upon by the people who have the power to make, take advantage of it. But I want to tell the stories where, like, you know, we, we, the, the catastrophe um, is, is going to be the, the, the create the, the, the grounds for, for positive transformation. Yeah. And actually, um, Claire, in notes from the burning age, for example, you use catastrophe, the literal burning, uh, of the land or natural disasters as sort of a, uh, a jumping off point for many narrative threads and the sort of mentality that, that your, um, fictional world has. Can you get into that a little bit and then kind of explain your approach to catastrophe and um, the actual force of nature as a catalyst? Yeah. Um, so I think in a lot of the conversations about climate change, we have an unfortunate cultural habit of talking about the planet as, as an enemy. Uh, the world is out to get us. There will be hurricanes, floods. The planet is... The enemy. And this is how you do end up with both climate change fiction and actually genuine serious conversations about geoengineering, as if we're going to be grown ups about that. Um, whereas in Burning Age, I thought it was quite important to change that approach and look at the planet as not an enemy, as vital to our life, as a thing to be respected, as a thing to be valued and appreciated. And we experience this cognitively anyway as human beings. We go out and to a green space and we immediately feel better and our blood pressure drops. Like science is literally there with a heart pressure monitor ready to tell you that you feel better in a green space. Go enjoy it, turn off Netflix. Um, so like instinctively, genetically, we're already geared to want to be part of this planet. But culturally for so long, the narrative has been one of conquering. Ever since the enlightenment, the narrative has been man conquers the planet rather than acknowledging that as a species, we are entirely dependent and part of this planet and needful of the planet to be functioning well. We are of the ecosystem, not masters of it. Um, so in Burning Age, I tried to talk about that, not least because, again, when we talk about narratives of catastrophe, we often go to quite a nihilistic place. But there is, I think, merit in discussing it from a gentler, almost, I hate to use this word, but almost spiritual place of but what is it when you let go of the things you assume you need? What is it when you actually step back and go, maybe I didn't need the SUV. Maybe it's enough that there's green and there's water and this world around me is more than satisfactory and enough and fulfills me. Um, because again, like tying kind of back to everything we're saying, when we talk about collective social action, 
we still often find ourselves needing to express that from an individual point of view. You are part of something bigger than yourself. How does that feel to you? How are you experiencing being one of millions? How are you experiencing being part of the forest, the sea, the mountain, the world, something bigger than yourself? And what is that individual experience of being connected to something vast? And I thought that was an interesting narrative approach, if nothing else, because you get to talk about agency in that. And when we talk about climate change, one of the big problems is that paralysis of, oh, God, I don't feel like I have agency, therefore I will not act. But if you talk about agency from the point of view of being interconnected with something bigger, you can conceive of action, you can conceive of being part of a thing. Um, and it was also, I think, important to talk about the planet not as enemy, not as threat. The planet is responding to our actions, but we are part of it, not the other way around. And when it comes to the Earth, everything is cyclical. You know, whatever happens, regardless, humanity may burn to the ground, but, you know, there's, there's, a lot of uh, misconception in in the climate change discussion about how the earth is dying. And from my perspective, it's the complete opposite. The earth is alive. The earth is, like you say, Claire, responding to the processes that we are putting on it and pressuring. But when it comes down to it, the earth, its time scale is such that it never it never truly dies. It's just going to adapt in a certain way and change, you know, it might become like it was millions or billions of years ago, just a ball of hot ash with volcanoes and boiling seas and stuff like that. But that is the earth still living. And so we as humans have to realize that we are a part of this natural system to the point that we become humble enough to know that we are a finite, uh, we are a finite collective. We are finite entities on this beautiful marble sitting in the middle of space. And regardless of what we do, you know, we are part of that natural system and we have to respect it, move away from ideas of, of pure humanism and understand that, yes, we are one with nature. It doesn't have to be some crazy hippie movement that all the Republicans in America will, will rally against. But it means, um, you know, like Sam talks about in terms of community, in terms of connection, moving beyond the individual and understanding um, that the change that we are trying to affect is something that will be bestowed on the generations that follow after us, what the future of the earth looks like. And if we commune with nature and commune with the geological and and biological world, we, we can ourselves sort of move towards a better future. You know, I think that um, it doesn't necessarily have to be hyper-optimistic or anything like that, but like you say, Claire, nature is not our enemy. And so if we are going to move forward, we have to understand that nature is our ally and there are ways that we can work together, you know, clean energy, um, you know, uh, sources of food that don't necessarily result in overfishing or agricultural uh, takeover, deforestation and things like that. Um, sorry for ranting, but Matthew, do you want to jump in here and sort of uh, give your take on what uh, humanity could do in terms of their relationship with, with nature? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love this, uh, what, what Primi you said where, and, and Claire, where, you know, just going into nature lowers our blood pressure and, you know, there's very real science showing that this, this benefits us. And, you know, what you said earlier about the challenges we face, I think one of the biggest challenges we face is decoupling carbon from economic output and and you know this notion that gdp gross domestic product is somehow the um the be all end all of a of a of a country's health i think we need to add like an environmental metric there but the, an environmental metric that includes human connection to nature and you know while 
I am an optimist at heart. I also think that I'm, I'm distrustful of human nature. I'm, I'm distrustful that if we just appeal to human goodness, that this will all be fixed. I, I think that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, most people are just caring about first themselves, then their immediate loved ones and family, and then maybe a, a, a little social group outside them, whether it's their, you know, local community or, or religious group or what, what have you. Um, beyond that, most people are either don't care or are actively hostile. And I think what, what that ultimately comes down to is that we have to make environmentalism and environmental aware, awareness something that is selfish. And I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive, right? Something where it's like, for my own good, for my own health, for my own benefit, I want to protect the planet and everyone in it. And I think once we do that, once we, we make that clear to, to people that this is going to benefit you know, you and your immediate family and your loved ones, then we will see a, a vast shift. And, and I think we've, we're already actually there in the United States. Like there was a study recently that said there was an actual rise in the number of people that think that climate change is real. It went from like 70 to 76 percent, probably because of some recent, you know, natural disasters, the droughts, the fires, the, the floods that we've been having. So I think it's like the, the the cultural awareness is there, but the political action is lacking. And so, like, if we can just decouple carbon from the economy and, and like the stranglehold that these corporations have over the government, the big oil has over government, which is going to be really, really, really hard to do, but we have to do. And, and I think the way to do that is is to really hone in on how this will benefit people in their local communities and their like how this is going to affect you know you and your family and everyone around you and if you don't do anything this is going to cause you a lot of harm but if you do do something you know you might actually have a really nice future if you if you act now so um you know those those are the concerns i have and i i think you know Every day, I think, how can we change the vector, the vectors of uh, of capitalism and the economy and you know the political winds? How can we point that towards this better future that I want, that that I think everybody would want, right? Um, how do we do that? And and you know, I don't have an overarching answer, but I think it's 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 one step at a time, one, one action per day. No, I think that's, that's a good sentiment, you know, one action at a time, uh, one individual at a time. And then we all sort of like make small steps and then together collectively, we make a larger movement. Um, and Sam, before you have to jump out here, um, would you be able to offer some perspective in terms of, uh, some ways, big or small, that you believe people can apply in their daily lives to make a difference? Um, yeah, it's, it's weird, right? It's like, I am always hesitant. Like there's this, there's this approach, right. That I think is, is really corporate driven, right. Of like, let's focus on individual choices. How about like, how about you don't use a straw at Starbucks and thereby save the planet. Right. There was a, um, we had some really severe flooding last month in New York city from, um, Superstorm Ida. And there was a like footage of like a entire subway station that was just completely flooded. And the caption was, but I used this, uh, but I didn't use a straw. Right. Um, so this idea that all we have to do is like cut consumption and, and we'll thereby all be heroes and save the planet. And I think that's bullshit. And I think that like, while it's true that individual choices matter and like, you know, I feel like there's a lot to be said for a vegetarian diet as a significant reducer of um, environmental impact. Um, I also think that corporate and governmental action is what's needed for like big picture systemic change. And that like all, um, you know, that, 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 that narrative of like you and your decisions is a function of corporate power and, and governmental inaction of like, let us not talk about how we what, what substantive systemic changes we need to make and how what how significantly we need to interfere with the ability of corporations to profit. 
um, uh, in favor of a different narrative. So, um, so yes, if you don't need a straw, don't use one. But also, like, call your senator, um, call your call your elected officials, um, go to protests, connect with activist groups in your uh, area. Extinction Rebellion is everywhere, and they're doing a lot of cool stuff. And um, no activist group is perfect or amazing or or you know. But but find the folks who connect who you connect with, and like you know, protests are super fun. Making protest signs is super fun. Like there's tons of of pieces of that um, that will you know speak to your particular passions and needs and abilities and like disabilities and whatever. Like whatever. Like figure out how to um, connect with. And there's lots of resources out there. And also like read cool science fiction that makes you feel like the world can be fixed, such as. That provided by your amazing uh, panel today. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sam. And Claire, you look like you have something to say. Get on in here. Um, as I, I agree with everything just said there. I was also going to say that um, in my capacity as someone who does work for the Greens occasionally, it is my job to occasionally be optimistic and inspire people who are listening to this not to go and kill themselves in despair. Um, so the other thing I'd add is that when you think about activism, um, in the UK, we have, for example, Extinction Rebellion, we have the Greens, one is very kind of working within the system, one is very, we shall blockade the motorways till you give in. Both, I think, are needed. Women's suffrage happened because you had the suffragists and the suffragettes. There is no wrong answer to the action that you take. So the trick is, I think, finding the action that works for you, exactly as Sam says. I also think I'd like to push back a tiny bit on like the idea that everyone is quite parochial necessarily in their world. I think a lot of people are. I think we do need local community. We do need local people to feel like gaining from something. We need to get into people's houses. They say your house will be better and your life will be better on an individual level if you do climate change. But to just push back, get that a little bit on this call is Sam and Brimi and like people who have given up what could frankly have been a nice career as a taxidermist or a butcher, whatever it is that took your fancy, and instead are having sleepless, sleepless nights in the name of organisation and taking action. I'm not saying that there are heroes or heroes are real, but I am saying that there are people fighting and the essence of a grassroots movement is that your individual action may, may, not, may not make a huge difference to the climate footprint per se, but if your individual action inspires five people who are inspired by five people who are inspired by five people, you are the good kind of COVID. Um, so even if you're like, I am not drinking from a straw and that will not fix the hurricane, if you, by not using that straw, start a conversation and can show by your action and your life that this is a perfectly valid lifestyle and it will make things better and nicer and there's alternatives available, then you have made a difference and the grassroots work matters. And on the flip side, Primi, I want to get your opinion. Um, we've been talking a lot about communities and individuals, but we haven't really touched too much upon the scientific community. Um, and you, as someone who is in the environmental science world, what is your perspective on how uh, the science community is communicating climate change and ways in which they could uh, improve? Or if you see that there are any particular failures of, of the community in order um, to communicate this effectively? Yeah, well, just speaking as um, someone from like most, I guess, entrenched in the um, scientific community of Alberta, um, we are all to a degree losing our minds because it feels like no matter who we talk to, except other scientists, um, our message is being filtered through something to be only what people want to hear. And that is really frustrating. And just from a SciComm perspective, um, nothing works because all we're giving people is, um, you know, from our perspective, information and um, help and suggestions as to what they could do differently. And all they're hearing is, well, I'm still not seeing any incentive to do any of the things that you're suggesting. And so coming at this from A, a scientist, but B, in government, um, what everyone else has been saying, I've been listening to that and kind of going, yep, yep, this, this is what's needed, not just collective action, but um, the scale of things, the individual making a decision uh, that's good for the environment isn't going to make a difference, and we know that. The individual affecting their community is going to make a difference. But what we need to do to solve the problem of climate change isn't even at the you know, local government level, the country, like the national government level, it, it's global. 
unless there is a global effort, nothing actually is going to change and the effort has to be immediate. And so that's the issue that I'm seeing even just locally is unless people get an immediate and significant incentive that changes their life for the better, no changes are going to be made because then otherwise, literally, you're disincentivized to change anything because no one else around you is making the change. And so that's the way corporations are looking at it too. They're going, well, I'm not going to do anything more environmentally beneficial unless it's legislated to and there's a significant penalty. Otherwise, I'm disincentivized compared to all my competitors. I will lose my competitive advantage and that's the one thing I cannot do. People are thinking like that too. It's almost like we've been infected kind of by the corporate mindset is not even, um, you know, I want to get ahead, but I'm not even going to plan further than the next quarter of my life. I'm not going to budget further than that. I'm not going to worry further than that. Like it's about a quarter. So that's our big problem is trying to get people to think far into the future, not just their kids or their kids' kids, but um, then you get back the response. Well, how do you guys know any of that's going to happen? You know, we're scientists. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to show you the code of our model as to when exactly the glaciers are all going to melt in Alberta and my city of about a million and a bit people is going to not have any water? And they're like, no, and we won't believe you anyway. Do you think so that there's a trust issue, there's a communication issue, there's an incentivization issue, and nobody is budging on any of it. And this is why I drink. <laughs> That 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 corporate and in, infectious mindset that you, that you mentioned, um, I think that also applies to countries and governments as a whole. And in November we have COP twenty six happening in Glasgow, um, and this actually touches back to something Premi you mentioned at the very beginning of the panel is sort of how much responsibility rests upon developed nations as opposed to developing or undeveloped nations. Um, and Matt, Matt, we'll get you to jump in on here first, but, but what are your hopes for this, uh, for this summit and what's your perspective on, on sort of how, I guess the global, uh, the global, uh, connection around summits like this, if it actually works in any, in any realistic way? Well, I mean, coming from the United States, I, I think like, um, Biden um, is actually really, really like one of the most environmental presidents I've seen. Now, is he doing enough? And I'm sorry, there's a car driving by. Um, is he doing enough? No, but like he's he's just saying like global warming is a thing. Climate change is a thing. We have to address it. He's trying to address it with his infrastructure plan. Um, you know whether or not he you know he can act with with a split Congress is is to be seen. And, you know, the rest of the world is waiting for uh, America, you know, and, and which is completely ridiculous because it, like, as, as we said, it's a global problem. Um, but they're like, well, if you're not going to act, we're not going to act. And um, so I think that the dangers of climate change, the threat of it has become very, very um, palpable. It's, it's less theoretical at this point because some some countries, a lot of countries have already seen the effects of this. So I think there's more momentum now than I've ever seen. Like I remember the Kyoto pro, uh, pro, uh, protocol and, and I remember like just they would meet, they would talk and nothing would happen. And I think the first one was in the 90s. And, and um, this time around, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that more will be done. What Will enough be done? No, uh, absolutely not. But I do see other positive signs, for example, um, the fact that uh, solar and wind power is now the cheapest form of power generation. Um, that was not something that existed 20 years ago. So like, you know, you want to move the, um, you, want to, you want to change corporate hearts and minds. We'll say, you know, look at the bottom line. It's cheaper to, to build a power plant from solar panels than it is to build coal or, or natural gas or, or nuclear or whatever. So, so let's do that and let's improve the environment at the same time. So I think there are 
literal economic factors that may that may help at this point. Um, is it enough? No, but but it's a start, and I'm I'm just happy to be moving because for you know I've been concerned about the environment since I said at the beginning of that class in college, maybe before, and I haven't seen action. And, and finally, now we're starting to see the needle just moving a little bit. So that's giving me optimism. Sam, do you want to jump in on this? What was the question? Uh, well, we're just kind of discussing uh, COP26 in Glasgow, if you have any hopes for that, but also about the, um, the responsibility between developed and undeveloped nations and sort of where does the balance lie there? Um, Well, I'm a bad environmentalist because I don't know what COP26 is, but I promise to Google it. Um, (laughs) uh, And I mean, I think that for one thing, like the, I mean, yes, as I've said before, and as others have said way better, like, you know, the developed world has a disproportionate burden of responsibility and accountability when it comes to causing climate change. Um, but I also think it's more complex than that. And also like, um, like I've been really inspired looking at indigenous resistance to climate change and how a lot of that comes from like what we think of as like the developed world, especially the U S and Canada. Um, but like, you know, there was a study published recently about like, I don't remember the number, but it's like a staggering amount of carbon emissions that have been blocked by indigenous resistance to things like um, pipelines and, and, um, uh, things that I, other people know more about than me. Um, but, but yeah, so like, yes, um, the developed world owes more and should do more to lead the charge. And that it's, 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 and, and also that like the developing world, um, I think is where a lot of the leadership is going to come from, but that also in, is like internal and like the, the traditionally marginalized and oppressed communities um, of the developed world are also like, um, leading the way in real life. And I think in fiction and narrative, um, that, that we have the power to sort of boost that and celebrate that and, and see that that gets the kind of like, um, you know, uh, 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 leadership that it deserves. And I think of a book like, um, uh, Rebecca Rowan horse's trail of lightning, which is sort of like imagining a future where like the, the, the American government, um, has in large in in many ways fallen but like the the indigenous folks have like risen to like a a form of like post-environmental collapse supremacy and like power and 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 stability um so so yes and 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 also like uh yeah cool cool activism is is not being led honestly no shade to any like uh, white people organization, <laughs> um, but like the the, tr- the most ex- inspiring and exciting activism to, to save the planet is is coming from from directly impacted folks. Yeah, and Premi, I mean, you're in Alberta, and I know there are a lot of indigenous communities, especially with things like the tar sands. There are, is chemical runoff that goes into their water systems um, and basically poisons whole communities. And so I think now. Um, Claire, I'll get your opinion on this. Where do you think something like social media, since, um, we are at a time where things like the North Dakota, uh, the pipeline in, in North Dakota or, uh, pipelines going across British Columbia from Alberta instances like that, where indigenous community and indigenous activism has been given a platform through social media and the attention has, has grown such that people who knew nothing about these indigenous communities, people who had no idea that these issues existed or that these corporations were trying to just denigrate pristine land or communities that are not their own, where technology plays a role in the future of climate activism. Um, I'm going to be a wuss again. And rather than answer that question immediately and directly, I actually think it's much more interesting to hear about the impact of the indigenous community and the fight of the indigenous community, the tools the indigenous community uses to fight that fight, because fundamentally there is and always has been a problem in most activist movements of lovely, fluffy, white middle class people like me saying, oh no, I've read about something terrible happened somewhere, I feel sad about it, but not actually being the voice, let alone the ally that matters. So actually I'm going to be a wuss and say, pre me, <laughs> indigenous communities, Alberta, wow, how, tools, what, where, where the went. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, no, actually, I, I was kind of nodding because as soon as you mentioned the tar sands, I can pretty much guarantee, um, again, because I'm inside the system and because this is part of my portfolio and, and I liaise directly with these communities and their elders, um, pretty well the only reason that there are environmental regulations of any kind around the oil sands area is because of the indigenous communities that live and work in that area. The only reason that there is reclamation legislation for them to eventually return the land to a usable state is because of those communities, because they have not let up um, on their activism and engagement and trying to increase visibility uh, with the rest of the world, because quite rightly, um, like a bunch of industrial conglomerates plunked themselves down square onto their ancestral lands that they literally need for their livelihoods. <laughs> Um, it's also interesting too, the way the companies have been pushing back against this is by saying, oh, well, you know, the oil sands were here before, so we're not actually the ones causing any of these clusters of cancer or this sickness or this pollution or the fact that, you know, your local animals are dropping dead or those blueberries over there are covered in a weird oily sheen. That was all there before. So their pushback is pretty weak, but yeah. They're the reason that there's any legislation up here at all. And the indigenous communities in Alberta are very politically engaged. They're very politically savvy. And I also see in my engagement work with them, um, who's asking for money from the government to help with engagement, you know, even to just like print out forms or get faster internet and who's not. So what Sam was saying um, just really struck me as incredibly accurate. In every developed, so-called developed nation, there are already existing several undeveloped nations. It may be indigenous groups, it may be you know poor people, homeless people, women, um, the disabled, elderly people, people with kids. Um, there's all these nations already being affected by climate change, while the overarching umbrella of this developed nation owes what it owes to them and is already not you know, supporting them or paying up, let alone outside the national boundaries. So yeah, I think we need to get our own houses in order first. Yeah, I'm I mean, from Canada... a terrible kind of, sorry, just, I, you asked about no, social okay. media and kind of my experience of that in the UK, hearing about all these stories. And the answer is that social media is an echo chamber. I hear about these stories because fundamentally I'm a wishy-washy lefty environmentalist. But the news does not broadcast these stories because fundamentally the news cares more still in this country and most developed world Western countries about what happens to white people. So social media is powerful, but it's still a social bubble and the news is still fundamentally pushing a kind of racist narrative. Yeah, I mean, they, they push the, the, unfortunately, um, these developed nations have second class citizens in Canada, indigenous people are pushed into a second class in the United States. It's the same amongst other races. And I think it, it comes down to, you know, how we act as individuals, the things that we consume in terms of news, in terms of media and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, Premier, you're in a very particular case where you see firsthand the actual evidence of what these indigenous communities are doing. And I think that's really powerful and it's optimistic. You know, it's, it's really positive to see that these communities are looking up to a politician like Justin Trudeau, who's a fucking clown and saying, this is what's happening to our communities. You spouted a certain narrative during your election and he did, and he completely backed up on that and just, um, turned his his face on the on the people that supported him you know and this happens in so many different countries where we can't necessarily rely on the politicians to be elected on a platform and then actually carry forward with that platform once their once their government is in is in power um and matt we'll start with you i want to sort of close this out just to get an idea of what as an individual do you feel like you can do to be optimistic about the future, but also pass on to the next generation? Um, I, I've, I've thought a lot about this, and I think a lot of my creative work 
is reflective of certain powerlessness I sometimes feel in the face of this. And so as a person who writes creative fiction and also recently got into 3D art, um, what I see as one of my abilities is to inspire people with a possible alternate future. Um, in terms of action, um, you know, right now, specifically in the United States, I see that uh, Manchin, uh, with his coal interests, is stopping um, the legislation from going forward, which includes a lot of things to address climate change, um, contacting your senators, your politicians, showing that you support a specific cause. They actually do tally these calls and emails and things like that. Um, in terms of local community things, um, planting community gardens, just like, you know, even in, in New York City where I live, and I'm sure you see this by you, Sam, as well, is like there's a lot of just unused lots, just, just empty lots. And wouldn't it be really nice if we just made them green, you know, like planted native plants and species. And, and you know, even in, in my yard here, there's a neighboring yard and um, they, they just didn't do anything. It's just it's completely overgrown. And at first I was like, eh, this is kind of ugly. But then like at night I hear crickets now. I'm in the middle of the city. I, I hear crickets and like, this is kind of nice. And like, I notice like, bir you know, birds or, you know, I see, I see uh, cardinals and blue jays and, and, um, you know, songbirds coming in and, you know, I, I think just like greening urban spaces, at least for, for where I live is, is something that I really want to focus on. And like, you know, instead of just having this kind of concrete, you know, uh, Claire, before you said, you know, this, this conquer narrative for a second, I thought you said concrete narrative. And I was like, yeah, it is kind of a concrete narrative. Like, I feel like that's what we've done to the planet. We've just thrown concrete over it. So like, I want to see more of like a local greening, just like, let, let's, let's turn this planet into a paradise. I mean, it's within our power to do it. And it's already there. It's just, we have to amplify it. So it's like, you know, all those things inspire people, political action, local action, all of that stuff um, is, is what I try to do. Uh, whether or not I succeed at it, I don't know, but uh, th these are definitely things that I work on. And Claire, what about you? What, uh, what are you optimistic about for the future and what do you feel like we can pass on to the next generation? Um, I agree with everything that's just been said. Um, I agree that community and communal action is the path to bliss. Um, I agree we need global change. Um, good or bad news, if you're in America, depending on your point of view, America is no longer considered a world leader. You had Trump for four years. We do not trust you even slightly. The rest of the world's just like, well, pfft, <laughs> done with that. And, and, you, um, and you should. No, no. I mean, maybe Biden can pull something back, but <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're done. Um, so take that however you want to, positive and negatively. Um, something that gives me optimism is that in other places, green parties are starting to take power. Scotland now has a green coalition. Germany is getting a green coalition. Holland's had a green coalition. Um, it is true there is a massive right wing backlash. And if you spend much time in green politics, you spend all your time realising that actually the powers that be that still hold the reins and still have their money invested fundamentally in extracting fossil fuels will push against every narrative and every change you can possibly bring. But despite that, despite the power, despite the weight of that, Green parties are growing, green parties are rising, green movements are rising, the green message is rising. Um, and my message to any future generations is a, sorry, we're, we're trying, oops, really, really trying to make up for it. Um, but also, revolution does happen and hope is always more powerful than cynicism. Always. I agree. And Sam? Um, I think that everything... That, that, that has been said and, and that I have said um, holds true, right, around like, you know, wanting to give hope and inspire and point prompt collective and individual action wherever possible. Uh, I think the other thing that I think storytelling can do is reframe people's sense of what the problems are. Um, and that a lot of times people, like we've said, right, when being confronted with the statistics of climate change um, will not you know, will not interpret them the way I wish they would, right? Have they been, if they, rec if they acknowledge them at all, they, they see them through a lens that's been shaped by a right-wing perspective or whatever. 
Um, but I also think that like showing folks how they have been negatively impacted, like how many like people being displaced by wildfires or flooded out of their homes or whatever um, are right wing voters. And 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 can we sort of like use like tell the story that 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 this is this is that there's action that we can take, that there's things we can do um, and that your beliefs have hurt you and that your actions, even if it's just voting or even if it's just silence. Um, have hurt you and hurt your family. Um, I think that's a powerful like approach uh, that I'm I'm taking with my with my storytelling. And also at the same time, showing empathy for those people. You know, it's like we are all humans in this uh, in this world that we share, and you know, regardless of political ideologies or regardless of of race or ethnicity or anything like that. When it comes down to it, we are all humans. We are all flesh and blood and bone underneath the skin and to show a little bit of empathy uh, for everyone and empathy for the environment at the same time, that can go a long way. You know, on top of what you said, Sam, it's like everybody's being affected by this. Unfortunately, there are some institutions that are pushing the narrative that your decisions are not resulting in a particular outcome that you and your actions while in the grander scale of things in the grand picture could be uh regarded as a as a small impact on this catastrophic snowball of 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 effect but when it comes down to it you know neighbor to neighbor communities within uh, communities, that's a better means of communicating with each other than fucking news outlets that are capitalist institutions that are seeking, uh, seeking capital gain through pushing a narrative. And so, you know, in the United States, if you're Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. You're a human. These things are happening. How can we collaborate as opposed to fighting each other or arguing about bullshit on Twitter, <laughs> you know? Um, and Primi, we'll, uh, we'll finish off with you. Um, if you can give, um, your thoughts on some, some optimism for the future, what you think we can pass on to the next generation? Yeah. Um, God, I agree with what everyone has said here. So, so, so much, but I guess to distill it down is very much, um, get politically involved, but also get loud about it, if you can. Um, the institutions that we're talking about that are pushing this narrative of you're powerless, you can't do anything, and the world's going to end, they have a megaphone. But, you know, 10,000 ordinary people just yelling could be louder than that. So if you're going to be active about something, if you're going to, like, email your MLA or, you know, call, call your reps or whatever, um, tell everybody you know about it get as loud as possible because the only thing that we have on our side really is numbers. We don't have power, but we can get loud. And, you know, as, as cynical as it sounds in politics, eventually the squeaky wheel does get the grease. The problem is we're not squeaking loud enough, but I do think that, um, you know, because this is the reason governments developed is to help, you know, control things on a large scale. Governments and, and politics is going to be the only thing that does shift the needle permanently because corporations aren't going to do it voluntarily. So we need to get loud and we need to do it together. And I agree, though, on a smaller scale, um, there's really good work being done at kind of like the municipal level. And even in those cities that are really focusing on the mitigation and adaptation to climate change, those are going to be more pleasant and safer places to live when all these disasters start happening. So. Get involved politically, get involved locally, and yell as loud as possible. I think that is a beautiful note to end on. We all just need to loud, just get loud, tell everyone, you know, get out there, make your voice heard. Um, shout at the politicians who are ignoring things because they live in their own bubble. They have their own echo chamber. And when there's enough power coming from the outside, pressuring them and pushing their buttons and telling them, hey, listen, 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 that might be something that finally pushes them over the edge to think like, oh, crap, if I want to get reelected, I have to do this. And that might be the reasoning. But 
Well, I, I, I know that for us, every time something comes in asking about what we're doing in our group, which is land policy, that becomes an AR, which is an action request. And we have to respond to that within 24 to 48 hours. And it does get CC'd to the correct politicians. They may not opt to pay attention to it, but it does exist. It's in the system. And we have to say something in a day or two. In 24 to 48 hours. Hell yes. All right. Well, thank you all so much um, for giving your your perspectives and and talking about your fiction, but also about climate change, something I know you're all very passionate about. And I just appreciate you being here and taking the time. So thank you very much. Thanks for having Thank us. Thanks, everybody.